Good morning. Welcome to Morning Devotions Live. First time since spring of 2022. Uh, it's now September the 5th, and uh, I missed being on here. I've missed you, and um, I'm glad that we're able to be back together. Looking forward to getting back into God's Word. Now, when we finished um, last spring, we stopped at um, about Luke chapter 12. Now, we're going to pick that up in the spring because we're getting close, we'll be getting into Holy Week and all that, and I'd lo love to have that last part of Luke to be involved in that season. So right now, during this fall time, I thought we'd start off in the Book of James and and talk about uh, you know how we how we live out our faith in difficult times so, and when we have things happening around us that we don't always understand, we don't always feel clear about, and uh, sometimes we just need some help. And so uh, we've certainly had a had an interesting season, haven't we? In this last, just the last month has been um, just one of the most uh, un, uh, difficult months, right, for all of us. And uh, anyway, the Lord's good, and He's been with us throughout all of this, and He will be faithful to us. Uh, let's bow together in prayer. Dear God, thank you for your love and for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. Thank you, Lord, that you have been very close to us, even in our uh, most difficult times, Lord. This last month was so difficult for the people of eastern Kentucky and in many surrounding areas because of the flood and because of so many other things. And Lord, but we know that you're faithful and you've been close to us. I pray for those that are still hurting, um, those that are still in need today, those that are still uh, sleeping in tents, those that are still uh, looking for hope and who are grieving. Oh, uh, God, for your comfort and strength to be upon each and every one. Lord God, we pray that as we look into your word this morning, that you're, you would give us hope, instruction, and guidance today and how we can walk closer to you. We thank you, Lord, that you're always with us in all circumstances. And we can give you praise and honor and glory because you're above all things. And we give you thanks today. Lord, we come to you. Open your word to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Anyway, we're in the in the book of James. Now, James is an interesting book. It's written by uh, James the Just, who, who that was his name, his nickname, uh, one of the half-brothers of Jesus. And if we remember, before the resurrection, Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. They, would, they taunted him in, in John chapter, I believe, chapter 7. Um, and uh, they, would, they just really didn't believe. But after the resurrection, they realized there's a little bit more to Big Brother than they thought. And James the Just became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And um, so he's writing this letter to, uh, it starts off, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Now, what is that all about? He's writing to Christians, but he's writing as the leader of the church in Jerusalem and his, his main audience is Jewish Christians. And uh, they are scattered all over Asia Minor. And this is also a reference. The dispersion was a reference in the, uh, to the, the dispersion that actually happened with the children of Israel as the exile came. And, and even after the exile, and they scattered all over the Roman Empire, what would later become the Roman Empire. And they, uh, they were all over the place. And they were called the diaspora, the dispersion. And James is using that same imagery to talk about the people of God, the, the church as the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, um, the Christians who are scattered all over Asia Minor. And so he's writing this to, uh, this this letter would go out to house churches all over Asia Minor and be shared with all the, all the different home churches and groups. You know, it was about the third century before they ever had what you would call a church building. Do you know that for the first three centuries, uh, Christianity thrived without a church building. They, they met in houses and caves and under trees and Solomon's porch in Jerusalem and, and just wherever they could meet, they would just gather. And, uh, you know, and so in, in different places like that. And so anyway, James is writing to all these different churches and he's writing to all these Christians, reminding them that God is with us in our struggles, but we've got to be with him. That God calls us uh, to faith and obedience, calls us to a life that, that lives in a way that reflects Jesus Christ. And, and so in this book, as we go through it, you're going to see a lot of things. You're going to see conflicts about uh, between rich and poor. And you're going to see 
uh, conflicts between uh, people who are uh, mistreating one another and talking badly about one another and, and uh, not knowing how to handle trials and difficulties. And, and you see all these kinds of things building up as James begins to address these issues. He starts off very generally in chapter 1. Today's message is called Learning How to Count. Learning How to Count. Now, this isn't a math class. See, I'm the last person that wants to do that. Um, it's out of James chapter 1, where James begins this letter by saying this in verse 2. He says, Count it all joy, brothers, and br that means brethren, brothers and sisters. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing now I want to start with that and then we're going to move down into, into verses 5 through 8 Lord willing um, you know James is he begins uh, it's interesting how he just starts the letter off he doesn't even talk about any specific things except count it all joy when you meet trials you know in the in this period this was an early part of the, the century, um, probably about the 40s A.D., and so not a lot of persecution was happening. Uh, there was some, uh, but, but not a whole lot. Uh, it, was, it was beginning to mount. There's always some, but, but the real Roman persecution didn't begin until uh, in the 60s with Nero. But, but early on, you know, there was some societal persecution and some, some trouble from the Jewish authorities and leadership, and, and there were those kinds of things happening. But there was also life. You know, life, whether you're being persecuted or not, has trials, doesn't it? And he starts off saying, uh, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. And, you know, it's interesting to me that, and one of the things I'm preaching in First uh, Peter uh, in, on my uh, Revival Now podcast, and by the way, yesterday I preached a message, and I'm not trying to be self-promoting here. I'm just saying that the message I did yesterday uh, kind of dovetails with what we're going to talk about today. And so if you want a little more study on it, a little more information, uh, you can go and listen to that message. It's called, um, uh, what is it called? I just lost my brains here. Um, it's called The Truth, I'm sorry, The Truth About Trials. And so if you want to listen to that, maybe get some extra thoughts about what we're talking about today. One of the big premises of that message yesterday was that uh, we, we've gotten a little backwards in our understanding of difficulties. We've, we've had the prosperity gospel and the feel-good religion shoved down our throats for so many decades that we've come to this idea that if you're suffering, if you're struggling, then that is a contradiction to your faith. That either, A, there's something wrong with you and you're sinning, B, you're not claiming enough promises, or C, this whole Christian thing is not true. And so and those are the conclusions a lot of people draw, that one of those three things, either something wrong with me or there's something wrong with God. Something's wrong if I'm struggling. Something's wrong if, thing, if the bottom falls out. Something's wrong. And yet, when you read the, the scriptures, you don't see that. If you, an honest look, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Paul wrote many times about his struggles. He said, we're... We're cast down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the death of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal bodies. He talked about that suffering as a reality, and, and it's often a because of your faith. I mean, a lot of times, you know, Christian trials, you know, if you're living in a way that follows Jesus, you're going to be going against the current of this world. And we've got to get away from this this non-gospel preaching that says, no, you're supposed to live on easy street once you're, uh, once you're following Jesus. Everything's supposed to, money's supposed to flow and the luck is supposed to happen and all the doors are supposed to fly open and, and you're not, if you're having any problems, you clearly don't have enough faith and, and you're clear. We beat people to death with that and, and, and so many people have gotten discouraged because we've told them this lie that Christianity means no trouble means no problem. In fact, sometimes your troubles are going to get worse sometimes. Because, see, we're not living for this life. And that's the other thing, is that, that many people have this world-centered Christianity that's just Chris and dumb. It's not Christianity that just says, you know, um, it's all about this life. It's all about now. And that 
uh, you know, this is your, this is where you're supposed to get all the stuff. And Paul is very clear in that. Jesus is very clear that that's just not true. Jesus said, don't lay up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven. Jesus talked about heaven all the time. And Paul, he talked about reach for the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I've been crucified to this world, and this world's been crucified to me, and I'm not living for that, that uh, we're living for a higher thing. We're living for a... Peter, in his letter, tells us that we've got a home in heaven reserved for us, unfading, incorruptible. Guys, that's what we're supposed to focus on. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you don't care about this world in terms of ministering to people. Of course you do. Um, a faith that doesn't live out in the daily, day-to-day -day routine is not real faith. And James will talk about that later in this chapter. But here's what I want us to re get a reset today. I want you to reset your thinking today and learn how to count. In other words, trials will come. Look at what James said. He said, look, count it all joy when, when you meet trials. It says when, not if. That's really important. He says, look, go ahead and prepare. Buckle up. Life is hard. Life is, is tough. Sometimes disappointments are going to come. Sometimes tragedy is going to come. Sometimes things you can't even explain are going to happen in your life. And if you follow Jesus, Paul said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He didn't say maybe, and I don't know where we've got all this nonsense that when you become a Christian, you're just in this bubble and nothing ever happens to you. Now, God does promise blessing in our life and great joy, but, but you can, listen, here's, a, here's a, an important principle. You can have joy and grief at the same time. Don't tell someone who's grieving that they, they just need to get over it and start rejoicing. Listen, when you've lost a loved one, grief is normal. Grief's part of it. But the, here's what we do as Christians. We don't grieve as those with no hope. That's what Paul said in, in Thessalonians. He said, he didn't say we don't grieve. He said we don't grieve the same way that those with no hope grieve. You know, if somebody without Christ, when they lose a loved one, I don't know how they make it. I don't know how they hold on. If you, if you don't believe in Christ and, and you've lost a loved one, wow, I don't even know how you're going to make it. Um, because for you, you, you don't even see any hope. See, I've got hope. If I, I've lost loved ones. I've lost dear friends. And I've, I've seen pain and tragedy. But you know the thing that sustains me is my hope that I'll see them again. And not only will I see them again, but the quality of my relationship with them will be exponentially greater in heaven and last longer in heaven than it ever did here. That my hope is, this is eternal hope, and we've got to bring that back. We've got to bring that back. We've become such a worldly church that we don't even think about heaven anymore. We don't even think about eternity. It's all about now. And, and so we've got to, to get back with it. And so James says, look, count it joy when you meet trials. Now, you don't have joy because of the trials. Nobody likes trials. That doesn't mean that what he's saying is the have joy. Why? How can you have joy in the midst of trials? Well, Paul, I mean, I'm sorry. I've been talking about Paul so long. James t unpacks that a little bit here, and he says, look, for you know. He doesn't say you think, you hope, you guess, you conjecture. He says you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, what is that telling us? That, listen, when you go through pain, when you go through struggle, you can be assured. It says you know, it, that great word for you know. It, it means that you can be certain that God is going to take that pain that came into your life, that, that thing that flowed into your life, and he's going to use it to strengthen you. At the end of the day, you're going to be the one that's stronger. At the end of the day, you're going to be the one in victory. At the end of the day, you're going to be the one walking in hope and strength and power. That you may be in a, you know, uh, grief comes at night, but joy comes in the morning. You may be going through it right now. You may be in a time right now when, when you've got great pain and loss. And uh, my goodness, if you're one of those that's lost 
uh, property and loved ones in this terrible flood that happened last last month, and you're wondering where am I going to go from here? And I want you to be to understand something. I'm not saying that you should just be happy, go lucky, and pretend you have no problems. I'm saying you can be honest about the grief. You can be honest about the heartbreak and the pain. But in the midst of that, un be undergirded by the joy of God. Nehemiah, joy of the Lord is my strength. And he said that to a grieving people. A grieving, he, they were weeping. And they, he said, the joy of God will be your strength. Guys, we've got to learn that it's okay to grieve. It's okay to have a broken heart. It's okay to express pain, even anger at times, knowing that underneath that are the everlasting arms, that even in your pain, God has you by His hand, by your hand, and He is not going to let you go. In fact, He's going to make you steadfast. He's going to make you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God's committed to this, this, what he's doing in you, right? God is more interested in what he's doing in your character than what he's doing in anything else. Look at verse 4. It says, And let steadfastness, or patience in some translations, have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Be aware that God is at work. And, uh, um, you know, in, in the sovereignty of God, he ne he. He never, nothing happens in your life that God either did not do or permit for his glory and for your good, ultimately. Now, you, you may be looking around at the mess and thinking, there's no good in this. And God wants to teach you how to look beyond the surface. He wants to teach you to look beyond the moment that you've got an in eternal inheritance that is greater than all of this that you're standing and looking at, all of this that you're wondering about. You've got something much greater and much grander. And, and you know, he's working. I mean, he's shaping you for that. He's got to prepare you for eternity. You were created for eternity. You weren't created for a few brief, short, meaningless years. You were created for eternity. And steadfastness is having its perfect work, even in the pain, even in the difficulty. God is standing with you. And he's not only doing that, but he's perfecting you. He's molding you. He's shaping you. He's strengthening you. He's refining you like gold. And, and God is weeping with you in your pain because he knows that these things that come into our lives are painful and heartbreaking. And he stands with you and he, he's present with you in that. See, I can have joy in my sorrow because I know that even though this moment is dark and painful and broken, I know that God is going to bring me through, not only in this life, but he is preparing me for an eternity that is unfading, incorruptible, uh, abiding forever. And he, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so we, I can rely on that. If all I'm thinking about is this life, I'm going to be miserable. That's what Paul said. If, if, if our, our hope is just here, we're the most be miserable people in the world. But our hope isn't here. Your hope is not here. God has something much greater for you. And so, but sometimes it's hard to get that. You know, I can listen, you can listen to the preacher say that, and sometimes it's just really hard. And it's hard to understand. I love how Peter, how James goes right into this next thing about asking for wisdom. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Let me just start, stop there for just a second. He's saying, look, I know sometimes, it, it just makes sense that this passage would go from trials to asking for wisdom. To me, it makes perfect sense. He's not just breaking off into something else. He's leading into something. He's building on this idea. Because you and I both know that there are times in life when we go through struggles that we just do not understand. And we can look around at us and we can see the, the pain and the disaster and the struggle and the confusion. And, and we're thinking, what in the world? I don't even understand this. I don't even know how this could possibly have happened. My goodness, ever since 2020, we have been watching the last two years have felt like 10. Haven't they? I mean, the last two years have felt like 10 because of all the different things that have gone on with racial stuff and, and uh, all the sexual perversion that's erupted and vomited itself all over our society and, and uh, you know, all the justice issues that need to be addressed and all the pain of, of sickness and, and political 
idiocy on so many levels and, and so many different things. And that's on both sides, by the way, so you both can be offended. But here's the thing. And just so much ridiculous nonsense happening around us. And then and then here in, in, in our region, we have this flood and we have so many things going on. And, and sometimes it's just hard to get your, your mind around it, right? That's no wonder James leads in to ask for wisdom. There are times... When, when you're so confused and overwhelmed, you've just got to go to God. And listen to this. It says, if any lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it'll be given to him. God isn't afraid to field your questions. God isn't standing behind a microphone, scared to death that you're going to ask a hard question. God could, will hear your heart, and he wants to know when you're... Have you ever read the Psalms? And the number of times the psalmist would say, God, why have you forgotten us? One psalm says, God, do you hate us? God, what are you trying to do to us? And Moses cried out to God, and, and different people, some prophets, and you see them crying out, not in, in uh, disrespect grump, for grumbling, but in genuine searching genuine searching and say god i do not understand this I, I i trust in you but i don't understand what's happening to me right now and you know and it's okay to do that now the, the israelites grumbled they simply accused god of evil they just said he's just trying to kill us he's just trying to kill us let's go back to egypt that's not that's not the same as david crying out oh god why is this happening jesus on the cross my god my god why have you forsaken me in that moment he absorbed that, that hopelessness that we all feel. He was expressing the hopelessness that humanity often feels. And sometimes we feel separated from God. And sometimes we feel like, like, like we don't understand what's happening and there's an eclipse in our, in our experience of faith and, and we can't see the sun. But even in, in an eclipse, the sun is there. You just can't see it. But here's the thing is that we've got to ask for wisdom. And sometimes I've got to seek the Lord. And it may be that right now you need to spend some time seeking God for his wisdom on your situation, your trial. But, but let me give you a, a, an important caveat. Here's the thing. In verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You know what? Listen, here's a hard truth. Trouble is not permission to disbelieve. When Jesus went into the house and parents had just lost their daughter, he said, don't be afraid, just believe. He didn't say, you know, I understand you not believing right now. I, I can see you de deconstructing because, you know, I just don't blame you at all for it. No, he says, look, you need to believe. Right now, I know it's hard, but you've got to believe God. Listen, we, we are called to faith even in our worst moments. We're called to believe. And sometimes faith is extremely hard. Sometimes the eclipse of our faith is so dark, it's hard to see God. You've got to cry out to him, and you've got to make a decision to believe, even when things look unbelievable. And, and the Bible is filled with those times when, when people are in a situation where they, they felt like there was just no way out. And God said, trust me. Trust me. Believe. And I believe that right now, there are many of us right now in a time when, when faith is hard. Believing is tough. And we don't know what's going on. And we don't understand why things are happening the way they are. We, but we, we, we have somewhere in the back of our mind and our heart the reality that God has said, I will not leave you or forsake you. And I will hold you. And I'm going to make you steadfast. And I'm going to make you perfect and complete. At the end of the day, you're going to be lacking nothing. You're going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to, be, you're going to have everything you need. And you're going to be, those needs are going to be met. And you're going to make it. You're going to get through it. And I want to tell you today... By the grace of God and with the power of God, through your faith in God, you're going to make it. Don't give up. And don't, don't give up. And don't fall to the world's idea that if things aren't going well, that must mean God is, doesn't work. Or God isn't real. Or I, No, God is the most real in our tragedy. He's the most real in our difficulty. He's the closest when we feel him the least. And so I want to challenge you today. Ask God in the midst of your struggle. Spend some time with him. Ask him for help. Ask him for guidance. Ask him for direction. Jesus Christ hung on the cross 
so that he could show us in no uncertain terms that God is committed to those who trust in him. That Christ, listen, the thief on the cross had eternal life because he believed even in his darkest moment. He looked at Jesus and said, I'm getting what I deserve. There's no way out. I'm done. Can you please remember me when you come into your kingdom? And that spark of faith was rewarded when Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Listen, this is the way Christ is. He's hanging on the cross saying to you, trust me. I know it's hard, but I'm with you. Jesus came to not only to die for us, but in a sense to die with us. He, to stay with us and say, I'm here with you. God is with you, and he has not forsaken you. But he calls you to trust him. You, you cannot say, because I'm having problems, I'm going to back out on my faith. Because I'm having problems, I'm going to bail and take a vacation from God. Many people do just the opposite of what they need to do. When you're in a struggle, that's the time to come to him, not to run from him. And so if you're hurting right now, if you're struggling right now, if you're afraid right now, that's the time. And, and it, I'm not saying it's going to feel good. It might feel terrible. Um, it might feel empty at first, but you go to him and you worship him. Worship is not a feeling. It's not entertainment. It's offering yourself to God. And that's what worship is. Give it to God. Say, God, I trust in you. I need wisdom. Please tell me, show me something. Help me to know how to move forward in this. And if he doesn't tell you anything, it's because he wants you to stand right where you are. Stand, be still, and know that he is God. Trust in him in this moment. Listen, he's going to come through. He's going to come through. This is the one who, when he rose again on the third day, he beat death. He conquered the most hopeless experience humans face, and that is death. He beat death when he rose from the grave. And be <clears throat> excuse me, because of that, you can rest in him and you can trust in him. And you can know you have not been where he has been. Um, you know, People often say, Jesus doesn't know where I've been. Oh, yes, he does. You've never been where he's been. You've never fought the devils he's fought. And you've never experienced death the way he's experienced it. You, you're the one that needs to learn. Listen, God will give you generously wisdom if you ask him. But this, this wisdom needs to be held in context of trial. Uh, you can ask God for wisdom for anything, but, but right here, don't divorce it from what James just said. Count it all joy, knowing that the working of your faith uh, produces um, Testing every faith produces steadfastness. That's the outward goal. And so listen, but you've got to, sometimes we have to ask God for help. Sometimes we've got to ask God for insight, for direction, for wisdom. Lord, what's the next step? And uh, if you don't know what to do, as my friend Ben says, then do what you know to do. Just keep doing what you know to do. Keep standing, keep believing, keep trusting, keep walking with God. Do what you know to do and he'll take care of the rest. Listen, thank you for listening. I want to pray with you. And then we're going to go. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you, Lord, for your word and for the assurance that we get from your word. Thank you, Lord God, that in this world we will have tribulation, but we can be of good heart, good cheer because you have overcome the world. We thank you, Lord, that you do not uh, put us in a bubble and keep us from experiencing the difficulties of life, but you give us power to plow through the problems, to plow, plow through the pain, and to find life, and to end up on the other side of this. Lord, we will stand with you in glory and in power and in love. And Lord, I pray for every person listening right now. I pray if there's anyone here right now who's never trusted in you, and they're in this dark hour that right now they would just turn to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come into my life and save me. Friend, if you want to pray that prayer, God will change your circumstances in your soul. He starts it in your heart and then works its way out. Listen, trust in him. Stand on him. And he will make all things right. God bless you and go in peace.